Hi everyone, my name is Dan Gosling, also known as the Chop Saver Guy, and I'm thrilled to be joined today uh, in a discussion of not only playing the trumpet, uh, but music making, a career in music, uh, the incomparable Wayne Bergeron. Wayne, how are you doing, so man? Great to see you. For being here. Incomparable, wow. Well, it's, it's I mean, a big word for you. It is a big <laughs> word for me. Uh, Wayne, of course, is a veteran of over, what, 400 movies? Something like that. Uh, yeah. TV shows. You've heard him on the Oscars. You've heard him on mo movies like The Incredibles, Incredibles 2. Uh, I know lead trumpet players around the world hate Wayne because of <laughs> La La Land in particular. Um, you yeah. actually had kind of a, almost a cameo in that, didn't you? I mean, Well, yeah. I, well, there's a big cadenza at the right. end that somebody sidelines to. And uh, so that cadenza, I'll tell you about that cameo. So that wasn't even written out. They had a piece of paper and it had a shape, a squiggly line. <laughs> I'm not kidding this. And so this is what you get into sometime in the music business. And they didn't know what they wanted this to be. So they said this needs to be 5.2 seconds. It needs to go downward. And then the next one needs to go upward. And the next one can be kind of something weird and intervallic. Those and then, are your instructions. Yeah, and then it needs to end high. I go, well, what key is it in? I go, well, that doesn't matter. I go, it has to matter. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter. It has to matter. So anyway, we, we go through it, and I play a little. Like, I go, uh, oh, 0.2 seconds too long. I'm going, you know, who thinks like that? So I anyway, I, I finally got it, and I go, why don't you cut me off? I'll, I'll land on a note on everything. So they, so that being said, then I end the thing. goes, but wait, da 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 the orchestra comes in, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so and then it goes into the big scene. It's the end of the movie. So, But I didn't know it. So I did all that. And then this was a year before the movie came out. Right. So what they did is they put all that together and they made it into a trumpet cadenza. So now if I'd have known, because now we perform this live now. Right, right. They and do La La Land live and they show the movie. Right. And, and, and uh, they do this with West Side Story and other movies mm -hmm. as well. And they show the movie. So when you get to that cadenza, somebody's got to play that now. Live. And the, yeah, and so you're playing it live and it's still a click track. So when I played it, it was free. But what I hear in my headphone is. And it's 5 4 bar and a 3 8 bar. And I, didn't, you know, I wasn't thinking about any of that. I was just playing some They licks. transcribed what, they you, transcribe what it. you did. And, so, and that, so that makes it kind of odd that you're having to play it exactly with this click track. Mm -hmm. And then it ends on this high A. Which is terrifying. And if I would have known I was going to be playing this again over and over, and I would have played a lower note. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Not only for other everyone else, but for yourself. Well, yeah. So yeah. So, so I've had to do it a few times. I've done it. I did a tour of Japan of it, and I played it in Korea, and I did it in Taiwan. I did it with the Dallas Symphony. So I've done it a few times. I was, and it's a pain, you know, for me too. And I played it. You know, it's my fault. But uh, uh, but I notice in there now they've got several different versions with lower notes because I think so many trumpet players have just cacked all over it. <laughs> You know, all over the world, and they said, you know, they don't, so they give them a lower note because it doesn't really matter. Right. You know, it's what's seen on the screen as long as it matches the picture. It's okay. Right. So that, anyway, that was, you know, that's how that went down. So, well, you've just had a clinic in what a day <laughs> in the life of Wayne Bergeron is actually like. You never know what you're going to see when you go in the studio. That's right. There was no one called ahead and said, hey, there's going to be this big, uh, Trumpet cadenza in this movie that's gonna that's gonna make millions, right? You just yeah, well, I didn't know. even when we first started doing the movie, I didn't even know what it was. I got a call from the contractor, uh, Justin Hur, what's composer La La Land? I'm going, okay, well, what's La? La? I don't know. Is it a TV show? Is it a cartoon? No, we don't know. Right. So we go into the first sessions. We're doing the jazz tunes, so we do these kind of like sound alike, kind of three horn tunes with a jazz band, and and uh, and we're going through them really quickly, kind of, and not getting you know the changes are kind of weird. And, and we're, we're kind of playing through it, and we, we'll play, go, okay, that's a take. And I'm going, no, man, we really need another one. No, no, it's fine. I'm going, oh, boy, I'm going, I hope this never sees the light of day, you know. And uh, I still didn't know what it was, really. Mm -hmm. And so we did a couple of sessions like that, and, and they just used little bits of that stuff. What they were saying is they had what they needed for the movie, even though we did longer versions of the tune. So when I saw the movie, I go, oh, that's, that's actually all fine. Mm -hmm. It's okay. You know, I was thinking stuff I was thinking I was going to hate of my own playing. You know, I hate leaving anything bad that the world's going to be seeing over and over and over again. And then we did some orchestra dates for me. And then I started realizing, oh, it's a movie about L.A., it's a musical. And it came to be a thing. Now this thing is becoming, becoming a cult thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm right. going to Taiwan right. again next year. We're talking about doing it again. And so so now I'm getting called to, to come out and, and tour it, and which is kind of fun. you know. Because like, you had no idea it would turn into something like that. Yeah, I had, yeah, I had no idea. That this thing would have such a another lifetime. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So it's become a little side career, kind of, which is cool, too. You know. So it was fun. I, did, I got to do a, a tour with the... Tokyo Philharmonic, 
which was a blast. You know, I was the only the only Gaijing, you know, right, the only right. foreigner in the band. And so they plugged me in and uh, in there, and I you know I look hilarious in all the pictures because this is one big tall giant white guy. You know? <laughs> but it was really fun, and the trumpet section and I and we hung every night. You know, just like such a fun. You know, I, you know I love meeting new players and hanging out. So that's a fun part of the game. So that's something you did uh, quite you know relatively recently. Yeah, a few years. You kind of have a name for, but your name was um, you know synonymous with top flight. Perfect nails, um, lead trumpet playing in a Hollywood setting. Well, let's talk a little bit about you know all the things that led up to you being able to perform at that level at this stage in your career. Um, mm-hmm. Because the early parts of your um, career, and and actually there's some funny stuff um, that Wayne did on uh, some things that I recorded a master class he did well almost ten years ago. Yeah. Um, you can actually still see them on the Chop Saver YouTube channel um, under interviews and master classes. It's like six little uh, short clips of Wayne. But you talk about like when you first started, yeah. which was, you know, if someone had seen the way you started out, <laughs> yeah. I mean, fair to say, I don't think they would have predicted the kind of career that, you, that you've had. Well, I, you know, I... So to be honest with you, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I mean, I, I was kind of a natural trumpet player when I switched from trumpet to French horn. I had some chops. I played very inefficiently, and, and you know, even though I could play high and do some things, I was a pretty good player in high school, but I played pretty raucously, you know, and I didn't know, you know, I didn't know I was going to be doing what I'm doing now, but I always knew I wanted to make a living playing the trumpet. So you did know that. Because, yeah, because my first gig was like in the ninth grade. I played in this band called Synopsis, and it was all seniors. And from a high school band, and then I, I'd come up from junior high, and their trumpet player had left, so I got hired to play this band. And my my first gig was at the Linwood Bowling Alley, where I grew up in Linwood, California. Okay. Played five hours, got twenty five bucks, and you were hooked. And I was like, I just made twenty five bucks playing the trumpet. <laughs> and I just thought that was a cool thing. And I said, that's what I want to do. And so we had gigs every once in a while. And then by the time I was a junior in high school, I was playing with another top forty band called City, and it was an East LA band uh, playing the Latino circuit. In East LA, but we played weddings and car club dances mm-hmm. and things like that. And I was the youngest member of that band. My mom, as a matter of fact, I was 15 when I did my first gig with them. So my mom had to drive me, and they were all older. They were all in their 20s, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, and I mean that band was making like 75 bucks a gig, and that's back then. That's you know, and for high school kid, sure. So yeah. I was like, so I was working on the weekends in high school, you know, playing weddings and stuff, and and I had some day jobs, but mostly I got to play music to make some money. I mean, I worked in gas stations and. Stuff like that. I never flipped burgers. I never worked McDonald's, so I feel like I dodged that bullet. Yeah, <laughs> you know, as a kid. Did you study music in college? I I started to go to junior college, and I was going to Long Beach City College, and I played in the jazz band there, and I was taking some general ed stuff. I didn't know what I wanted to do, you know, really, and uh, and I needed money, you know. I thought when I got out of high school, the music industry was going to beat my door down and. And go, oh, we need Wayne Bergeron. Apparently, that wasn't true. <laughs> there was other people. <laughs> they right. were seeing other people. Right. So, uh, so I left college and I, I got a job at McDonnell Douglas Aircraft, which is now Boeing uh, in Long Beach. It's a big, you know, giant, you know, right company there. And anyway, I was a tool and die maker because my dad was a machinist, so I had some machine shop experience. And I got the job and it paid really well. It probably paid ten bucks an hour back then. And you hadn't finished at. No, no, I just dropped out of school right. to go work. And I was playing on the weekends a little bit, doing dumb gigs, but mm-hmm. I really wasn't taking the trumpet very seriously. I wasn't practicing. You know, rarely did I practice. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just kind of played. And I was, you know, I wasn't taking it that seriously. Um, I got an opportunity one year into that job. Uh, I got a call to go on the road with this guy named Buddy Miles. And I don't know, you know who Buddy Miles was. He was kind of a one-hit Wonder in the late '60s, and he had a tune called "Them Changes," and you'll know the riff if I sing it. Do 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 do. Oh yeah, okay. Do 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 do. That's yeah, yeah. That little bass riff, you know. Every tune, famous tune has a famous bass riff, you know. So I got a chance to go on the road with him. So I got a call from just somebody musician I knew. Hey, this guy Buddy Miles is just got out of prison, which is a whole other master class for another day we can do. He just got out of prison for drugs and you know things and. And uh, he was putting, you know, put band. He played with Jimi Hendrix. He was in the band of Gypsy. So he was pretty famous, very talented drummer, guitar player, and singer. Right. I mean, totally great on a kind of a ignorant street level, but great, you know. So uh, we started rehearsing to do this thing. We had a six-piece horn section of this great band, and uh, we had, you know, these great charts to play and stuff. So you're like 20. 
Uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, this is 1980, probably 82. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, maybe I'm 20, 20, in that, in that range. So we go on the road, we go to New York. It's my first kind of road trip. Wow. And we, we take a plane, I've never been in New York City, we get there, uh, but we have limousines pick us up, and I'm thinking, man, I'm... I have arrived. <laughs> you just man, made. I have just made. Man, look at this, man. So we get in these limos. Well, that's where the, the luxury ended. Was right there. So they take us to the Chelsea Hotel in in the Chelsea area of New York. Now, the Chelsea Hotel now is a uh, it's a very nice area of living. It's it's kind of a, kind of a gay district of New York, and mm-hmm. it's. It's been fixed up really right, nice, right. you know. They, it's really nice over there, and and that hotel now is very trendy. Well, at that time though, not so trendy. It was a uh, uh, just to give you uh, a taste of the glamour of this place. Uh, you know who Sid Vicious is? Yes, of the Sex Pistols. Right, right, right. This is the hotel where he killed his girlfriend. Oh, nice. Okay, so this is where that happened. Okay, so that's room one hundred and one, and that's where the sax player and a couple of the other guys roomed in room one hundred and one. And Brandon even wrote a tune called Room One Hundred and One. So we're staying at this f- dump. Of a hotel, but I don't care, man. I'm in New York City, on on the limo ride from there to the hotel, these girls, go, what band are you guys with? And I'm an idiot. And I got the window open, the limo, thinking I'm cool, you know, just being stupid. Oh, we're playing with Buddy Miles. What hotel are you staying at? Oh, the coast. So they follow us over there, <laughs> you know, and we meet these girls. I meet this girl, Lisa. It's a very good word. You know, we still say hi on Facebook, which is really cool. Really, and and uh, so anyway, they come to the gigs with us and hang out. We went and hung out and had dinner and you know, had fun with them. And uh, we did our first gig, which was in Rockaway Beach, Long Island. And uh, it went really well. And then we did a couple more. Because well, we haven't been paid yet. That was the, kind oh, of the drawback. Oh. No <laughs> money yet. And they're saying, oh, yeah, the management's going to be, they're going to be wiring the money. And mm-hmm. So anyway, we do like five or six gigs. And the, the thing's folding. Oh. And so they're not going to pay us. So they oh, sneak geez. out of the hotel. And this is before, you know, you know, all the technology we have in hotels now. Where you, you know, I didn't have a credit card mm-hmm. or have any money. So the management left, they stranded us in, in New York. But I had a plane ticket home. That's all I had. Mm-hmm. Stranded. So I had to sneak out. And I'm just sneak, literally sneaking out the fire, you know, the fire exits you see on those big buildings. Right, right. We had to sneak out because they didn't pay the bill. Wow. So, the, so that was I'm going this sh- like... show business. Isn't this <laughs> awesome, man? <laughs> so it's kind of my, my first road gig. And... Uh, and I moved, I, but it was my my last day job though. So from the musicians I met on that gig, uh, there's a great sax player, uh, Brandon Field, and a sax player named Jeff Jorgensen, who are two of the finest sax players that I know to this day. Great, great players, and we got to be really good friends, mm-hmm. you know. And so when we got off, got back, made our way back home, and now we have we all have these stories to tell about right, right. about this, and there's stories I can't tell right now, but <laughs> we, we have some version. stories. Let me tell. You. So. Uh, we get back and then we, we're all keeping in touch and they recommended me for some gigs but they worked with a lot better musicians than I was used to working with mm-hmm. so now I'm hearing better musicians and trumpet players that they know then I, and I go man this guy this guy Walt Fowler you know I play with him I go man this guy is like great a lot better I realize he's better than me you know mm-hmm. so immediately you become when you're around somebody that's better than you everybody steps up their game a right. little and instantly right. you become a better player kind of right. or so, you don't blast yeah yeah. so I mean you gotta be listening so you so anyway, I kind of started growing as a musician. I started getting a little bit more, more serious about playing the trumpet. So I had some natural ability up to there, but I really had a lot to learn, and I still do. I'm still I'm 60 years old, man. I'm still catching up with this, trying to undo bad habits, and you know, trying to. I, I wish I knew what I knew now, because I would I would have taken a different approach. Right, we all. But no. that I look, I can you know, we can all look at our careers, and we can usually pinpoint back to a turning point. So that horrible experience really turned was- out to be. A good, a good, because I my career blossomed from there. That's a it was slow. It wasn't like oh, I yeah, have arrived. Right, right. But I started getting better work, <laughs> and then I started you know auditioning for places like Disneyland, and because I just wanted to play, and so I worked there for ten years off and on, you know, doing goofy, wearing goofy costumes. So you're doing and, the, the parades and yeah, the parades and, 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 and the like shows that. and subbing in the Disneyland band and, and and all that stuff. And that was another training ground because there was so many great musicians working there. Mm-hmm. That I, I might have got the opportunity to get in there, and then man, you start learning because these players play better than me there. Right. So I was learning a lot, so I was becoming a better player. And expound on that. <clears throat> I was becoming a better player. Yeah. Well, what kind of things were you doing then? That, that well, I would hear somebody play something, you know, and you hear that, and immediately you start imitating. I mean, we I also get together with somebody. Maybe mm-hmm. we play duets. Mm-hmm. I hear this person, and you know, we play duets together. Maybe it's a classical player. I'm a classical player, and then I'm listening how to their how they play. 
And, um, and they might even be saying, oh, yeah, tongue the notes lighter or whatever. And so I, I was learning. I was getting free, uh, getting paid to take trumpet lessons. Right, but you weren't, like, studying with anybody at the time. Not or... really. I mean, I took some lessons with different people, but not at that time. Hi everybody, Wayne Bergeron here, and I want to tell you from day one, I've been using Dan Gosling's Chop Saver. I've tried everything else that's on the market, all the names that you know, as well as some of the things that are made within the industry, and I keep coming back to this. If my chops are swollen or sore, I'll put this on before I go to bed, or even they just need to be moisturized. My wife likes this stuff a lot too. Uh, I highly recommend this product for, for anybody, uh, not just musicians, but anybody with chap lips or any kind of lip problem. Um, quality product and uh, I'm proud to endorse it.